Subway could avoid some problems if it consulted more with its franchisees, or so says the head of its biggest franchisee association. Hello, I'm Jonathan Mays, Editor-in-Chief of Restaurant Business, and in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with Bill Mathis, who chairs the North American Association of Subway Franchisees, or NASA. Subway remains the largest restaurant chain in the U.S. by unit count, with some 20,000 stores domestically, even after thousands of its locations have closed over the past decade. Mathis is a subway operator out of Minnesota, and NASIF represents much of that franchisee base. The association rarely speaks publicly, but Bill is breaking that silence on this podcast specifically to talk about some of the group's concerns with the company's current strategies. Bill and I talk about communication between management and the association and what impact that could have on some of the chain's current strategies. But we also talk about several other issues, including Subway's relatively new slicers and the impact they have had on food and labor costs. We also talk about Subway's recent requirement that franchisees accept all digital coupons and what that is doing to the operator base. Bill also discusses the purchase of Subway by Roar Capital, and the association's view on that deal. We also talk about the general financial condition of franchisees and the state of food and labor costs in the system. It is an in-depth discussion with one of the most prominent franchisees in the country's biggest sandwich chain, so please have a listen. Okay, I am here with Bill Mathis. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Jonathan. It's an honor to be here today. All right. So, uh, Bill, uh, talk to, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do. Well, I've uh, been in the subway system since 1992. Uh, hmm. I worked as a field consultant for a development agent. And in 2001, I had an opportunity to buy my first store. And between that time and 2009, I built two more stores and, and bought an additional. So I had four stores. Uh, became a nem- member of NASIF in uh, 2002, so like a year within the time I became bought my first store. Uh, and well, probably about five years ago, I started working on some committees, kind of helping them with some stuff. Um, three years, four years ago, I was elected to the board of directors. And in 2023, I was elected as chair. And we just had an election about a week or so ago, and I was reelected as chair. So for those listening, I'm I'm very honored and privileged to serve as chair of NASIF. Okay, so tell us what NASIF is. Well, NASIF was formed in uh, 1999. We're one of the largest franchisee associations in the country, and we represent anywhere from uh, 35 to 50 percent of the restaurants in North America. And you now people are going to say, "Well, what, why are you being so vague?" Well, we have a lot of stores that that sell at times and. Um, you know, some of those new owners who might buy, say, a, a chunk of stores may not hear from us for a few months until we get that information. So, you know, the membership is kind of always ebb and flowing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we have so many objectives at NASIF, but, you know, some of the main ones, if, if I will, not to turn this into a NASIF infomercial, I don't want to do that. But, you know, we advocate for franchisees. Uh, we want to be the voice of, of our members. And if our members are are seeing struggles with operations or have concerns, um, you know, we want to communicate that with the subway leadership team. Uh, We share best practices among each each other, and uh, we provide educational seminars that may range from how do you fill out this uh, specific waiver form to all the way to what are my rights under this? Or uh, we do a review every year with with our uh, council that uh, talks about the changes in the FDD. So people who are looking to buy a new franchise, you know, they, they'll be aware of what's happening. Mm-hmm. So now NASIF, uh, and I've covered Subway for a while, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, NASIF has, I think in in 17 years, I think, of covering Subway, I can remember one time NASIF said anything about anything. Um and that makes this particular conversation pretty notable. Why is NASIF now deciding to talk? Well, we think that our, our voice needs to be heard, and we need we have a story to tell. We, um, we've tried to communicate with subway leadership over the last number of years, and um, quite frankly, it would be unfair of me to say that they don't respond at all. Sometimes they don't respond at all. 
sometimes they respond and say that they want to work with individual restaurants or individual owners and essentially don't want to recognize this as an association. Um, and so we, we've been ignored, and I think we have a story to tell. Mm-hmm. So what's, what is your biggest uh, overarching concern right now with, with subway management? Uh, I think from a NASF side, it would be communication and collaboration. Uh, mm-hmm. As I just kind of mentioned, they don't. Uh, it would be unfair to say they don't want to communicate because at times they do respond, as I as I mentioned. Uh, but they don't want to. They don't want to work together uh, with the association. And you know, we represent, like I said, you know, nearly fifty percent of, of the restaurants in North America. Mm-hmm. If so. If- one of the one of the issues right now is the subject of remodels. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, we uh, sent them a letter, and uh, which we did receive a very brief re- reply to. But we sent them a letter this spring that talked about stores that are remodeling or required to remodel, but they may only have three years, four years, or five years left on their franchise agreement, and it's difficult for them as a franchisee to go to the bank and say, "Hey, I, I need." 60, 80, 100,000. So that's what these remodels are costing. Some of them, if you are over 100,000. And, you know, the bank's going to want to say, well, how do we, how do we amortize this? And how do we, how are you going to get a return on your investment when you may not have a store here in three, four or five years? You, you'd be out of your franchise agreement. And we made a proposal to them that say, hey, look, I know you're not going to extend this franchise agreement for nothing. Um, so why don't we talk about some, uh, some numbers where, people could extend their franchise agreements so that the bank could give them the loans to get these remodels done. You know, nobody at NASIF is saying our stores don't need to be upgraded. I think the last number I heard is about 50% of it been been upgraded. They look great. Um, mm-hmm. And you just can't, as you know, Jonathan, you just can't continue in this restaurant world and have stores that look like they're 20 years old. People will stop coming. So we, we advocate for the stores being remodeled, but we want to make sure our franchisees have an opportunity to get that return on investment, at least have time to pay off that loan for the remodel. Mm-hmm. So you're not arguing, so you're not arguing against remodels. What you're saying Absolutely. is you have, you have a situation in which a, 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 a restaurant has a limited time left mm-hmm. in their franchise agreement uh, and Subway wants them to remodel their locations, but um, you know, a sixty to eighty thousand uh, dollar remodel cost, by the way, for a subway franchisee is actually quite substantial, if I am not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you just want some sort of uh, you you want to work with Subway to at least ensure that that franchise agreement is going to be renewed. Well, if not renewed, at least extend it to a period mm-hmm. of time where they can uh, pay off the loan and and hopefully get some kind of return on investment on it. Why you know, wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they extend it or renew it early? I don't know. Well, first of all, they don't have to. Um, they may, as you may know, and I, I don't want to get off too off topic yeah. here. What you're talking about on the remodels, but the franchise agreement uh, changes, and it significantly changed a few years ago. So mm-hmm. um, that gives the franchisor a little bit, you know, reason to, to they could change the franchise agreement in that time. I, I don't know what their thinking is. You, you'd have to ask them. On, yeah. on why they don't want to extend these franchise agreements even a few more years. Yeah, yeah, but I, it's, uh, but um, I mean, couldn't they just just like hold off on the remodel until the franchise agreement comes up? Well, they could, but then you might be sitting on a remodel that or a store that's not remodeled for three, four, five years, whatever that mm-hmm. might be. Yeah, I guess another uh, question is the thing of slicers. One of the big moves that Subway has made. Mm-hmm. A very big move that Subway made was the addition of all of these slicers to the restaurants. How is that yeah. going? Well, there's there's mixed uh, thoughts on this. Uh, mm-hmm. The first thing I can say, if we're just going to talk about data, we haven't seen any data that says these slicers have driven sales, driven customer counts, or or profitability. Um, all I can speak to is what our members have have discussed, and um, it ranges. It has a wide range of opinion on this, but I think the bottom line here is that nobody is saying this is the greatest thing, if I may say, since sliced bread or since sliced meats. Mm -hmm. Um, People are struggling with it. Um, 
but not everybody. Uh, people have had to spend more labor hours into it. Yeah. Um, it takes a little bit more time to slice it than it does how we did it before. You've got to clean the slicer, and we want these slicers to be clean. There's n nobody saying, hey, you just go ahead and skip that, save on the labor. My gosh, no. So it takes time to do that. Uh, there's waste involved uh, because of the end cuts. Sometimes people, because we have to slice so much at a time, lower volume stores may have to throw away product before the, the shelf life is up, which we encourage everybody to do because we want to serve the best product available. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, um, you know, again, no data on what the consumer perception is on this or how they react to it, but just listening to our members, it's really a mixed bag where some people really don't care. It really doesn't matter to them. Um, mm -hmm. To a few people saying, you know, you're trying to be somebody else, another competitor, but you're really not there. So nice try. Mm -hmm. I, th I thought it was supposed to save on food costs and give you a, a, a quality halo. Does that not well, happen? That, not, not that we've seen. And I think the one thing that hasn't been taken into account is the waste factor. Uh, mm -hmm. Some stores are reporting that they might be wasting four or six ounces a day. Some people are reporting that they're wasting pounds in a week, uh, well mm -hmm. over five to ten pounds. You know, that may be a situation where they've had to discard the product. Um, but back, back, you know, to say a, a year, two years ago, I mean, we were taking it out of uh, uh, packages that would come to us. And, you know, the labor involved there is really nothing. And the waste is little to nothing, literally. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And like how many, you know, a typical subway, how many at a, on a typical shift, how many people do you usually have on staff at any time? Well, I would say that for the average store, um, you usually have one person to open the store and, and then you maybe you'll have three over lunch. You'll have anywhere from one to two in the middle of the afternoon, two to three over dinner. Uh, and then depending upon the restaurant location after dinner is where some stores see a real increase labor because a lot of our closers, as we title them, um, the people who close up the store don't want to work by themselves in different areas. No. In my area, it's not a problem up in north central Minnesota, but in other areas it is. And so those people don't want to close by themselves. So now we've got two people on. Um, so it's going to range after 7, 730. It's going to range from anywhere from one to two people. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how much how much say do, do franchisees get into this? Because there's another issue involving in involving some equipment and things like that, where uh, it seems like franchisees didn't get uh, that that a lot of these things are being are being implemented without that much say from the franchisee base. Uh, maybe you're referencing something that uh, well, I don't remember. It happened last spring, I believe. Uh, where we were mandated to replace certain ovens and toaster ovens. And mm -hmm. what, what's crazy about that is, first, let me say that NASIF, and including myself, isn't advocating for let's have old equipment that doesn't function properly and do the job it's supposed to. Nobody's mm -hmm. saying that. But what's ironic is shortly before this this mandate and this requirement of replacing certain ovens and toaster ovens, they had an independent company come out and look at all of our toaster ovens and ovens and people who passed their inspection shortly after learned that they had to replace them even after getting a passing grade. So hmm. I think that that was a real frustration for a lot of people because some people put a lot of money into their equipment to maintain it, make sure it's functioning still as if it was new, uh, where the temperatures are the same as it was when it came in. Uh, when they bought it, it might have been only ten years ago. So um, I think that it was definitely a real frustration for membership. Yeah, yeah. So did you have a lot of say in the slicers? No, that we had. Mean franchisees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly, NASIF didn't. We didn't have any say in it. Uh, I, I know that uh, another group uh, that is a uh, the IPC. They were mm -hmm. aware of this test, and I, they had some participation in it and some knowledge of it. But uh, it rolled out really quickly in terms of here's an idea to we went to convention, and this idea is coming to a story near you very soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
One of the big issues right now, and probably arguably the biggest issue in the system, well, maybe one of two big issues in the system right now, is this issue of coupons and digital mm -hmm. coupons. And um, uh, correct me on some of the details, but at the end of last year, they started requiring you to accept digital coupons, something they didn't do in the past. Uh, which uh, created, as I recall, a fair bit of consternation among the franchisee base. Could you talk a little bit about that, what's going on there? Yeah, so I've got to make sure I'm in the right years because you said last year, which is only Yeah, like 2023. 12, 12 days ago. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, so in September of 2023, uh, we were notified that effective December 28th that all stores were going to be mandated to honor all digital discounts. Uh, and, you know, I've, I feel like that is a way to circumvent the franchise agreement. But what they did is we have to follow the operations manual. They simply changed the operations manual to make this a requirement. Well, that uh, fundamentally changes, you know, what we agreed to and, and what we should expect for, for profitability. Now, it's too early on to say whether this is a good thing or bad thing in terms of profit, sales, customer counts, any of that. Because there was a fair number of stores who weren't participating in this, which is why I think they had to do this mandate. I certainly don't have numbers of how many stores weren't participating, so I didn't want to throw that out there. But it was substantial enough that I think they had to make this policy change. Yeah. I mean, you know, generally speaking to me, I've, I've always preferred discounts that are tied to a loyalty program. Like if you ask me, you know, where I would like to see a brand give out discounts or would be with a loyalty program. And I think the issue with Subway here is that they're advertising this very heavily. They've advertised their their discounts quite heavily. And some of these disc is some, you know, in a Subway, by the way, in a Subway buy one, get one free uh, offer, which is they've off, they've off run on from time, time to time. You know, that's like, that's like $13, $14. It is. Get, yeah. So some of the, um, I think some of the ramifications that they did see coming, which are, are happening, and this is where I wish they would, would talk to the organ our organization, NASIF, so we could give them this kind of feedback. Like, here's what we think these members and franchisees are going to, how they're going to react to this. Um, so we have the buy one, get one free footlong right now, and that goes on for a whopping 26 days. Um, and that in itself is frustrating. But what some franchisees have done is, and we're not advocating for any of this, but this is just what, what some of the members have done, is they've raised their prices to offset for the coupons. So if a sandwich should be $10, maybe it's now 12 And so the regular customer, our everyday customer who's not using any discounts is kind of subsidizing that. Um, others have taken the... Um, the high price sandwiches off the remote order. So you can't take advantage of the buy one, get one free with that. Some stores have even gone on to closing their store on the remote order during busier times. So they don't get those orders. None of this is good for our consumer, none of it. And I just wish we could be more consistent. I think their goal was to get everybody consistent, but uh, these are all independent business owners that are our members and they're going to think for themselves many times and try to figure out, ways to best make a profit for themselves mm -hmm. how is the what's what would you say is the, the the condition of a typical subway franchisee right now? financially well what do you mean a condition like for, like financial condition what's your what do you think how like what's what are the biggest hmm, what uh is like how are fin franchisees how are subway franchisees doing financially right now from your perspective I mean, are they generally doing pretty well? Are they kind of surviving? Because uh, Subway, you know, is closed an awful lot of restaurants since even, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, I don't have the 2023 numbers right now, but like even, you know, when, if we remember in 2022 when they closed a few hundred restaurants, uh, which was good for them, mm -hmm. um, you know, but still more than any other restaurant brand did that same year. Um, you know, what, what's, what's the condition of subway operators at the moment? Well, I'd, I'd be super speculative to say that. I mean, because some mm -hmm. people are, are probably doing very well and some people are wondering, geez, can I make payroll next month? 
Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's so wide ranging, and some of it, you know, all of it comes down to what are the conditions that that you have in inside your building. What's your rent? Do you have mm-hmm. a loan on that remodel still? Uh, where's that at? Um, you know, I I I would be not serving our association properly or our members by giving you a, a specific even generality. It, it's going to range. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, are are you still getting is Subway giving you uh, pressure on pricing right now? Uh, no, no. You know, there's a little bit of pressure on pricing and. I think it's coming more from uh, the local people, which would be the uh, business developers uh, Mm -hmm. or agents of of Subway, and then their own employees are called uh, SMOs or Subway Market Operation people. Yeah, they. um, I've seen reports that where franchisees are on this list, and if they're inside or outside five or ten cents of the recommended pricing, it's frowned upon. No, I'm not saying that Subway is sending letters or threatening letters or anything like that. Uh, but certainly, you know, when you show up on a report that's not a negative report, many people take that to heart. And, and most people are very want to be cooperative and, and, and be part of the family, if you will, and comply. So they don't want to see them on that list. So if direct pressure, no, but maybe some in, indirect pressure, I would call it. I, I've never seen anything like that in, mm-hmm. you know, even since I've been around in 92 where, you know, you better be in this price or you're going to have, uh, end up on some list or somebody's going to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Now, they also wanted you to be open a certain number of hours per week, yeah? Yeah, 91. well, that's always, that's always been a requirement, and we certainly mm-hmm. think that stores should be off open as often, often as they can uh, to serve the customer, but also at the same time make a, make a profit. So, the hours right now that are required are 91 hours, and I believe in most cases that, I shouldn't say in most, in many cases, um, stores are open when they shouldn't, don't need to be open, when they're not making any money. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the ways to get around that is to apply for a waiver, and that goes through either the BD or the SMO. Um, but I've been told that that process is going to get much more stringent, and they're going to be much tougher on, on people to get waivers. Mm-hmm. You know, so our thing is they want, I think their their mindset is we want to be open and available most often for the customer. So they see we as a place, Subway, that we can go and be relied upon. And as I said, we want to make some money. But mm-hmm. if we're open and we do $15 in, in that hour, well, we lose money because that barely just covers our labor, if anything. Uh, but w- what's interesting is if we did $15 in that one hour and every store did that in an extra hour that was open, I can't blame Subway for wanting to be open longer because they're going to take in over $8 million in royalties over the stores hmm. on 362 days. So I kind of get it from their end, but you know, from our end as franchisees, we need to make money when we're open. Right, right. Um, how are, what's your, um, well, let me, um, uh, let me, let me ask this. So now has, has Subway traditionally been really cooperative and, and with you guys, I mean, is they have your traditional relationship going back, uh, however long been generally pretty good? Well, I can't speak before I was on the board. I can only speak to the mm-hmm. point where, uh, here was that I came down the board was 2020. Uh, and, and shortly before that, Mr. Tindy took over the leadership role at Subway. And since then, we, we've had very little communication uh, and no collaboration in terms of working together. Mm-hmm. So I guess what's the incentive for Subway to, to work with you? Why, why, would, why should they, they work more closely with, with the association? Oh, that's a great question. Because we represent so many of the stores in North America, and um, people, I believe people are more free to speak to us than they are to say to go to a, a leadership person. But we can gather all this input uh, together as as an association and work with them to come up with the best ideas possible. You know, I'm, I mentioned before about this BOGO discount and the mandating discounts. Uh, if they were to sit down with us 
and talk about this, they could show us, hey, why this is a good idea. We could even possibly, I'm not saying we would, but get behind something that where they show us the data, it says, we look at it and go, this is great. And then we can talk to them about what the downsides are of, of mandating this discount. And the biggest thing is, uh, on this end of things, is frustrating the consumer. Uh, we certainly don't want to see consumers frustrated from seeing stores doing all these kinds of different things to try to find a workaround on it. Uh, mm -hmm. It would just be beneficial if, if they would talk to us, we work together. Look, we all love this brand. Uh, I, lo I love this brand and it probably got, uh, some people might call me crazy that I'm, I'm still in it, you know, being in it this long, but there's just something about it. I love it and I, I think this brand has, has a lot of growth still to go, but we're mm -hmm. gonna need to work together to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, Subway is sort of in a limbo mode uh, with its sale to Roar Capital, mm -hmm. um, which uh, is apparently being eyed uh, by federal regulators. What is your uh, what is the, 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 the thoughts of the, the franchisee base uh, on that particular situation? My perspective, from what I've heard, uh, a few times is that franchisees would really like to see the deal get done um, without any question. What's what's does NASA have a point of view? Well, here's our, our point of view is this is Mr. Chinzy and his leadership team have done some really good things. We have some disagreements on some things, certainly that we've talked about today, uh, but they've done some good things. Um, our series subs are excellent. I love them. I think customers love them. I, I'm sure you've probably tried one. I think they're pretty darn good. Our advertising is really good. And so he's done some really good things uh, since he's taken over. But I think we can do some better things. And if the company doesn't sell, uh, then we look forward to trying to w work with the current leadership team. If it does, we're excited to work with, with Rope Capital and their leadership team as well. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding mo what most franchisees think, I, you know, I, I don't know specifically what they think. I know there's a lot of chatter out there, and I know it's a big talker in the restaurant world. I wasn't shocked that you asked the question today. Yeah, yeah. There were, I mean, I guess some of the, there were some real concerns. Well, I think that the, the FTC's issue is that they have concerns about the amount of uh, restaurants that that uh, Rourke would own. Um my perspective, at least from the franchisees base, is that the only real concern is if, uh, you know, is if that the brand moved to take over the supply chain, which would be a significant would would be a significant move, it's something that the franchisee base would would definitely not like. Um, mm -hmm. That in some form or fashion, that in in that process, that that Rourke would perhaps move to take over the supply chain. I don't know if they would necessarily do that or not, but. I know that that's at least the fear that I've heard from some franchisees. Well, we received assurances that that is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I believe that if the deal does go through and Rourke ends up buying Subway, as long as they operate it as an independent business and they're not sharing our information with Jimmy John's, Jimmy John's isn't going to want, you know, them to share their information with Subway either. So you run them as independent businesses, mm -hmm. then, you know, I don't, I don't see an issue with it. Do you consider Jimmy John's a competitor? Absolutely. Yeah, of course they're a competitor. You sell sandwiches, you're a competitor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's, I, I think that there was, I saw some argument, and I'm sorry, but it didn't work, is that, like, I think Rourke was making the argument that Jimmy John's and Subway aren't really good. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yes, they're, they are. They're complete competitors. I eat a lot of sandwiches. I, I, I'm a, I, I, I eat probably more sandwiches than I frankly should. And, yeah. The choice is frequently between, you know, Jimmy John, Subway, and Jersey Mike's on a pretty regular yeah. basis. They, those are the three closest to my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I know a lot of other people are the same way. It's, it's, they're, they're roughly similar. I mean, you know, they have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, like everything else. And I like mm -hmm. some small three chains. So they're competitors. Um, one last, I guess, question is, is, uh, um, just generally speaking, is is uh, fr from the franchisee standpoint, like how uh, there were really the past couple of years for a lot of franchisees, not just in the subway 
sector, not in just in Subway, but in, in any fast food business or food business period, is that you had a, a real, you know, rising labor costs, rising food costs in a difficult time matching, uh, offsetting that with prices. Is that still a concern in the subway system or you see, see things getting better from your standpoint? Well, in the labor market, I think, uh, you know, I always, when people ask me, how how's your staffing going? I always got to knock on wood because yeah. at any moment you could all of a sudden be like, oh my goodness, now we've got people into overtime and such. Uh, I think the labor market's gotten a little bit better. Uh, mm -hmm. Our food costs have, have steadied. Now, when we get into these mandated discounts as we continue <laughs> through this, as long as it's mandated, uh, you know, we may see that change. But I think the food costs and the labor costs have kind of leveled out a little bit. And I know, as you know, from Minnesota that uh, and uh, other states, they've they've changed the laws on uh, what they call PTO time. I mean, it's called mm -hmm. it's ESST, I think. And so those are driving some of the labor costs as, as well. But I think they've flattened out. So I, I think that's been a good thing. I mean, people have been able to kind of say, okay, I'm 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 kind of above water here in most cases and I I, I can see land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where they go from there and how they get to land is is the next step. So right. maybe that's a terrible example. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. What's your what's your favorite sub? My favorite sub is the Philly cheesesteak. Um mm. uh in terms of like the series subs, but if I had truth be told, I'm going to get a tuna sub with Baja Chipotle sauce on it, jalapenos and pickles. And I'm going to get that on white bread. Very nice. All right. Bill, Jack cheese. Oh, well, got to Don't forget the cheese. Bill, yeah. this was fantastic. Really appreciate you joining me this week on the podcast. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. And that should do it for this week's episode of a deeper dive, which was edited as always by spoons. Artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. And you may subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I am Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.